Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our fourth webinar. Um, today, we'll be going over uh, vibrational circular dichros and spectroscopy, and our presenter today is Dr. Carlos Morello. Uh, Dr. Morello received his postdoc at Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Fukuoka and was a research scientist at Kyushu University in Japan, where he lived for several years. Carlos received his Doctor of Engineering from Kyoshu University and his Master's in BS from Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela. He is currently an application scientist at JASCO, and he's going to now give you his presentation on VCD. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, today. So today I'm going to be talking about the principles and application of vibrational circular dichroism spectroscopy. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about the JASCO. Uh, JASCO is the Japanese spectroscopy company known in Japan as Nihon Bunko, uh, where the research and development department and manufacturing are in Hachioji, uh, Japan. Some of our uh, founding members is the famous physicist uh, Yoshio Fujioka and the Nobel Prize winner Shinichiro Tomonaga, who shared the uh, physics uh, and on quantum electrodynamics with uh, Richard Feynman in 1975. And JASCO was established in the United States on mid-1972 in Eastern uh, Maryland. So we have uh, several different products uh, regarding uh, spectroscopy like FTIR, Raman, VCD. Those are the products that I usually support. And uh, today we are going to be talking about VCD. Also we have uh, UVBs, fluorescent, CD, and also a product of uh, chromatography as HPLC and CFC. Uh, so some of the topics that I'm going to be talking today is the basic uh, principles. Of course, I would like to show uh, what JASCO offers regarding the uh, BCD instrumentation. I'm going to review some measurement uh, procedures, some of those parameters that are really important to uh, acquire very good uh, data and see and um, show you uh, some applications that maybe you can find useful. Uh, I would like to talk first about infrared spectroscopy, also CD spectroscopy, because uh, vibrational uh, circular dichroism uh, the combination of two techniques. So I would like to show first what is uh, the infrared spectroscopy. And for the infrared spectroscopy, uh, when a sample is irradiated with infrared light, its absorption spectrum then is measured. The absorption bands are different for different molecules and different uh, functional groups. For example, the polystyrene, we can see that the CH bonds are absorbed in the 3000 uh, wave number. And in 1600 wave number, uh, the benzene ring is uh, shown. So in the case of the infrared spectroscopy, specific functional groups are absorbed in a specific uh, wave numbers that they are reciprocal of the vibration of those molecules. For that reason, FDIR can be used as a tool for qualitative analysis also for molecular uh, structure uh, characterization. Regarding circular dichroism, uh, in the CD spectroscopy, a simple a sample is irradiated with left and right circularly polarized light, and the difference in absorption is measured. If a sample is an optically active compound, left and right circularly polarized light will be absorbed differently. So what is BCD? BCD, as I mentioned before, the infrared 
is the vibrational part, the circular dichroism is the CD part. So in the vibrational, the absorption, as I mentioned before, is a absorption in the infrared region due to molecular uh, vibrations. And the circular dichroism is the uh, degree of absorption of left and right-handed uh, circularly uh, polarized light. So the VCD is going to measure the difference in absorption of left and right hand there's circularly polarized infrared light and the difference with the ECD uh, or as is known as CD or circular dichroism is the circular dichroism is in ultraviolet visible uh, region. I just want to remind you that last week, uh, Dr. Pandesia made an excellent uh, webinar about uh, circular dichroism. I invite you to look into our previous webinars because all these webinars are connected and it will help you to understand uh, better what we are presenting in the following weeks. Uh, so an example of the BCD spectrum uh, for D and L alanine, uh, very interesting that the, in the IR, we are not going to see a, any difference between the L and D um, enantiomers, but in the BCD spectrum, we can see that the red line that is the BCD spectrum for the L alanine is reversed with the D alanine. Okay. Uh, so, why this happens is because alanine is a substance that exhibits CD behavior. And these uh, type of compounds are called optically active compounds. And they have an antiomer that cannot be superimposed on their mirror image. So as in the case of the human hands. So if we look at the molecular structure of L-alanine, is the say is is a mirror image of the D alanine. As I mentioned before, they cannot be superimposed. These uh, there are different type of chirality, and this point chirality that I'm uh, presenting now, this is the case of the L alanine. Also, we can have a different type of chirality, like the planar chirality involving uh, the front and back sides also axial uh, chirality associated with a rotation about a particular axis and the helical chirality associated with helical uh, structures. So why uh, the importance of the absolute configuration and stereochemistry? One of the famous historical cases, the thalidomide, where we have um, one in enantiomer that is the R, uh, which is effective against illness, and the other case is S, that is, uh, this enantiomer can produce uh, birth uh, defects. So what is learned from BCD spectroscopy? Uh, first of all, uh, all organic compounds absorb in the infrared region, so there is no need to add a chromoform to the sample. Also, the chiral compounds can be uh, identified as, uh, for example, the alanine that I just showed before that have two uh, enantiomers. And the big advantage is that the absolute configuration uh, can be determined by comparing the measure spectrum with that uh, that is based on molecular orbital calculation. So how to determine the absolute uh, molecular configuration? This is a very uh, straightforward and simplify a procedure where the calculate and optimize molecular geometry is uh, dependent on, on the sample that you are analyzing is calculated also the next step would be optimize those uh, molecular structure following to a measurement of the bcd spectrum of your sample and then compare the calculated and the measure spectra to determine the uh, absolute configuration. One example is this mole uh, molecular model used uh, for simulation. 
Uh, there are four ester groups bonded to a benzene ring with a mental uh, molecular molecule uh, bonding to each. So these molecules can assume a vario conformation by freely rotation these uh, ester groups. And this shows the results uh, after simulation of uh, these molecules. It is possible to have five different forms. After the simulation of the structure, we can also simulate the BCD spectrum and then compare which measure spectrum match uh, the calculated spectrum. In that way, it can be uh, validated the uh, absolute structure. Some of the considerations that should keep in mind when making and when doing a BCD measurement is that a high sample concentration is, being, is needed. So that implies that you need uh, at least from 10 to 100 milligrams per millimeter. And also keep in mind that the BCD signals are very weak, so the accumulation time, the accumulation time is uh, required. Actually, uh, the signal intensity is more than the two orders of magnitude lower than the ECD. And a uh, high sensitivity and stable instrument is required. So let's uh, look at the uh, approaches or <clears throat> that JASCO offers. So we have two instruments. One is the FBS 6000 and the other is the VFT uh, 4000. The FBS 6000 is a dedicated uh, bench for uh, VCD uh, measurements. And the BFT is an accessory that is attached to an FTIR uh, bench. If someone goes with the second option, you still have the opportunity uh, to use another technique as a uh, ATR. So uh, the FBS 6000 is an optical system that is based in our high-end uh, research model, the six JASCO FTIR 6000. And these instruments have a light source interferometer, a photoelastic modulator, a sample compartment, and a detector. So the light source uh, is an infrared light, and it's going to the light is going to be transformed in the frequency domain in the Michelson uh, interferometer. Only the light in the measurement range is transmitted through the optical filter. Then it goes to the polarizer where it's, where it's linearly polarized. And the left and right hand uh, circularly polarized light is uh, goes through the uh, PEM and then uh, through the sample. And the signal is recorded by a detector. So the sensitivity is improved in this instrument because, as I mentioned before, the BCD signals are very uh, weak. So the, the design of this instrument use uh, interferometer with an incident angle of 28 degrees, which is different from what is a standard for FTIR bench that is only 45 uh, degrees. With this uh, change in the incident angle, we have an increase in the sensitivity of the instrument of the 2.2 uh, uh, compared with the 45 uh, degrees. So, Besides the, this improvement in the high throughput, we also use a sensitive detector and an optical filter. So the MCT detector that we use is the Mercury uh, Camion Telluride detector. And this is a high speed, high sensitivity detector that is capable of following the uh, PEM uh, modulation frequency. And it's used for the BCD uh, measurements. 
So, but the NCT detector alone is insufficient to achieve high sensitivity. So, also we use an uh, optical filter. So, since the this detector is very uh, sensitive, is very there is a possibility to saturate the detector. So, in the FTIR normal bench, a uh, metal bench. A metal mesh is used to uh, attenuate the light. So when we use the metal mesh, what happens is that the sensitivity of the detector is reduced, as you can see in the left-hand side, how the uh, mesh decreases the sensitivity, and that gray area is what is uh, our new sensitivity after using the mesh. But if instead of using the mesh, we are going to use an optical filter where the light is attenuated, uh, but not in the not as attenuated as the metal mesh, we can have a uh, infrared uh, light intensity that which is really high. But with the optical filter, we can have uh, an, a specific region of interest that in this case 2000 to 850. So there are two type of detectors, uh, MCT detectors and the photoconductive uh, MCT detector. As you can see here uh, in the green graph we can see that no metal mesh is used but one of the issues to use to don't use the metal mesh is that we are going to uh, form this pseudo signal in the uh, in the sides of the uh, measurement. So when we use the metal mesh, first we are going to cut the signal in 70%, and it's going to decrease the the sensitivity of the uh, of the instrument around that 70%. So one of the options, and this is the detector that we use in our instrument, is to use a photovoltaic MCT detector. And as you can see, we are not using a metal mesh. Also, we don't create this uh, pseudo signal. And at the same time, the sensitivity of this uh, MCT detector is three or four times higher than the PC the photoconductive MCT detector that I showed uh, previously. So in the, I, I talk also about the optical filters and the optical filters, uh, they are going to filter uh, the sensitivity of the signal in a very specific uh, wave number range. So the most common uh, wave range that we use is from 3200 to 2000 and from 2000 to 850. In addition, uh, there are more filters uh, that they are used and these filters are related to each area that is of interest. And in the case of the 2000 uh, wave number to 850, uh, we use a specific MCT uh, detector because there are different species there that we are interested, like single double bond uh, oxygen, single double uh, carbon uh, a functional groups. And the other region of interest is uh, the high wave numbers where we have like OH, NH, and CH uh, bonds. So uh, since we have different regions, we also have different detectors that depending on the wave number that we are interested, we have to select our uh, detector. So using a MCT detector, the sensitivity uh, decreases at high wave numbers, whereas in the uh, MP detector, we have a most effective uh, measurement. So in this example, we have two uh, measurements of camphor uh, plus and minus. Uh, in this graph, it, this is the on top we see the infrared absorbent uh, spectrum, then the VCD spectrum, then the VCD noise. Uh, in the 
in B detector, we can see that the spectrum are very symmetrical, and in the MCT uh, detector measurement, they are not as symmetrical as the INB. So the INB detector is a better choice at high uh, wave numbers. Also, in this example, we can see that the in this region with the MCT detector, we can see uh, a lot of noise in this region due to the solvent. And because of that, in this case, the EMV detector can uh, represent a better choice. Okay, and uh, regarding the last point for the, the advantages of using a BL, FBS 6000 is the symmetry and stability. And one of the features of our instrument is that the light source is uh, placed in the outside of the instrument. And because it's placed in that area, we are trying to reduce the, any thermal uh, drift into the measurement. And at the same time, there are thermostats inside the instrument that they re uh, keep the uh, temperature constant, and it doesn't have any influence on the baseline. So this is an example of the uh, the measurement when the thermostat is applied. Here you can see how there is a drift in the baseline due to the thermal uh, variation. But when we use our thermostat that keep the temperature constant and there is no influence, external influence from the uh, from the environment, we can see that the there is no changes in the baseline. So I would like to go to the uh, sample preparation or the different parameters that you should keep in mind when making a doing a measurement of uh, BCD. We have a liquid sample cell. This is the common cell that is used for STIR transmission uh, measurement. Um, these, usually these cells have two windows that they are going to be either barium fluoride or calcium fluoride, and they are going to, you are going to select these uh, windows based on the range. This is the wave number cutoff for uh, barium fluoride and calcium fluoride, and both and they are either soluble in water or insoluble. The other uh, parameters that you should keep in mind is the sample amount. As I say, the concentration is around from 10 to 100 milligrams uh, per millimeter. So keep in mind that you are going to use a larger amount of uh, sample if you compare the measurements with CD. Also, uh, volume that you can use for this type of uh, cells is around 100 uh, microliters. Also, I recommend that you check the solubility of your sample depending on the solvent that you are using. So the solvent is the other critical parameter that you have to keep in mind when making a, a measurement. You are going to find different uh, uh, organic solvents. But for example, uh, for BCD measurements, uh, we can use carbon tetracolide or uh, chloroform or dichloromethane, because in these regions you don't see as much peaks. That means that the absorbance of the solvents are not going to overlap your uh, peaks of interest. In this case, uh, we see that the, a measurement of uh, chloroform in the IR, the peak of chloroform already saturated the uh, detector. So the BCD and the BCD noise is an area that you cannot use for the measurement. So some of the solutions for solvent that has a uh, strong absorption in the IR is to use deuterated uh, solvent to reduce the effects of uh, solvent absorption. And if you can see here, uh, In this type of solvent, you are going to have a shifting of the peaks, so you are going to have a wider area to 
do your uh, BCD uh, measurement. In the case of water, it's really interesting because the water can uh, overlap all your measurements. So one of the options is to use option is to use the heavy water, and you can see how the D2O uh, reduce the absorbance of the of the actually the the water. But uh, on top, of, uh, uh, we wrote that we are using a calcium fluoride um, cell with a 50 micrometer uh, spacer. And this is the other uh, parameter to keep in mind when doing a BCD measurement. We can change the, the spacer of the cell to four microns and shortening the optical path, we can also reduce the effect of the absorbance of the solvent when you doing the measurement in uh, water or D2O. So uh, the other parameter that is really important in your measurement is the concentration. And in this case, we have a uh, count for. And as you can see, the scale goes from zero to one. And this is the most appropriate uh, uh, concentration. If the concentration is too low, that you can see in the left-hand side, it goes from zero to 0 0.1, the IR absorbance is, becomes really small. So the BCD peak intensity also becomes a small. As a result, the signal to noise ratio becomes uh, really poor. In the other case, that now we have a scale from zero to five, this is high concentration. So what happened here is the sample concentration is so high that only a small amount of light is detected. And the BCD spectrum quality is again poor. So the noise becomes really large uh, in the wave number region when the sample uh, where the sample absorption is really strong. So this is uh, what happens. So the most appropriate uh, concentration is the one in the middle. And actually, the recommendation uh, from us is to keep the IR absorbance adjusted to 0 0.7. So these are the different uh, BCD uh, measurement uh, parameters that I would recommend. Uh, please uh, look at your concentration of your sample. What type of cells are you using? The windows, also the type of solvent, and if the solvent have uh, so many peaks that it interfere with your measurement, you can change it to a uh, deuterated uh, solvent, or the other option is to go to a shorter uh, optical path length. That means a shorter uh, spacer using the cell. Last uh, recommendation is use a uh, concentration that is the most appropriate is to go to 0 0.7. Uh, and this is uh, uh, when you have a sample that is more challenging. Uh, and you have different peaks in the same uh, sample, but maybe your sample of interest is in the low wave number, you can have a higher uh, concentration. Uh, this would be a concentration that is not that high, but if you're interested in this peak, actually you can change the concentration of your sample uh, depending on the peaks of your interest. So I think that that's more advanced uh, uh, measurement, but I thought it, it is worth it to mention. So the last uh, item of my agenda is the application. I want to show this uh, measurement using uh, the auto sampler. This is the auto sampler recommended for us for the FDS uh, 6000. As you can see, there are three positions, and this is ideal to measure the D form, L form, and then the solvent. And you can uh, use, you can do this measurement uh, secondly. So the baseline drift in this uh, measurement is minimal. 
due to the short time when you're changing from one sample to another, and this is what is called the shuttle effect. So this is an example of the camphor. Uh, the, you see the IR spectrum, and below that is the BCD spectrum of camphor using the auto sampler. You can see with the <clears throat> auto sampler there is no drifting in the baseline. Without the shuttle, there is some small uh, drifting. Another uh, measurement using one of our accessory is the is this one like use the thermostated cell holder. And this accessory, besides uh, holding the cell, it can uh, we can control the temperature and the range it goes from minus five to ninety uh, Celsius degree. And here you can see a different a different uh, protein measurement. So uh, for those familiar with the protein measurement in FTIR, the peak uh, around 60, 50 is amid one. And even they look uh, similar in the BCD spectrum, you can see that they are, uh, they, they are different. And for example, you can have a uh, sample that they are rich in alpha helix, like hemoglobin, lysosome, that it has a mix between uh, alpha helix and beta sheet, and uh, concannabulin that, that is a beta sheet uh, rich uh, protein. So actually we can do some study regarding the secondary structure of proteins in BCD. But when we use uh, uh, protein, when we want to do, make a, uh, do a measurement with a lysozyme that is alpha helix rich, and we are using our uh, thermostated cell, we can see that the uh, IR spectra, uh, when we are changing the temperature, they remain almost the uh, same. So there is a suggestion of protein uh, degradation between 71.7 to 76.1. And if you can see these values is where we see changes in the uh, BCD spectrum. So actually this is, this is an alpha helix uh, protein, but what this uh, measurement is suggesting is that the alpha helix structure has been lost after the heating of the sample. In this um, application, we see the result of a study on temperature dependent of enzymatic reaction of uh, carbohydrate. So when the, as you can see here, the carbohydrate maltohexose is mixed with the enzyme at uh, constant temperature, is going to, what is happening is like the hydrolysis of glucose and the glucosidic bond of this carbohydrate, actually what is happening is going to be uh, weakened. So in the BCD spectrum, there is a peak associated with these uh, glucosidic bonds. And in this uh, work, what it was done is to do the measurement at different temperatures at different uh, times. You can see here the, is the peak of the glucosidic bond at 11.49. And you can see that the intensity of this peak changed with the change in temperature and time. So if we plot the absorbance uh, of each temperature with changing the time. So what we find is, what the author find is the glycosidic bonds of this enzymatic reaction is temperature dependent. And uh, also what we, what it was found is that the optimum uh, temperature is, is between 55 and 60 uh, Celsius degree. The, this is the last uh, application, and these, in this uh, work, uh, the confirmation of carnitine family was a study. And actually, uh, very important is that the carnitine, L-carnitine is used for food uh, additive in the food industry, but the D-carnitine is toxic. So in this work, 
which is really important is that the synthesis of the enantiopure carnitine and the analysis of the, of the excess on the enantiomeric protein test is very important because they want to determine what is the exact uh, uh, conformation. So uh, what, what they did is very similar to uh, the, uh, the procedure that I showed before where the molecular structure was identified, also the BCD spectrum was calculated, and then the BCD spectrum was measured, and then it was uh, compared between the experimental and calculated BCD spectra. But what is really interesting from this work is that the, this spectrum, spectrum that we see at the bottom is the, calcul is the measure spectrum, and the spectrum that you see here uh, labeled as 1C, 1B, and 1A is the conformers of the, uh, the carnitine family. But this average uh, spectrum, that we see, spectrum that we see here is a combination, it's an average of these three uh, conformers. And in real life, this is what we are going to be uh, facing is very challenging uh, measurements where you are not going to compare maybe only one spectrum is maybe what you're going to have to compare is an average spectrum because your uh, uh, measure of the experimental spectrum have one more than one conformer. So in this work the I think we, what we can highlight is like uh, with BCD, the absolute configuration and the examination of the conformers uh, can be performed using uh, BCD. So in, to summarize my uh, presentation, I was talking about the basic principles and I think that we can highlight that uh, no chromoforms are required for the uh, organic compounds and the absolute configuration of sample can be determined uh, with the comparison between the measure spectrum and those uh, calculated or simulated. Also, uh, different approaches for measuring uh, weak BCD signals are taken care of using the FDS uh, 6000, like a photovoltaic uh, MCT detector, also an optical uh, filter, uh, the uh, thermal uh, drift uh, taking into consideration using a thermostate uh, inside the instrument and also the IR source is placed outside of the uh, bench. Regarding the measurements, some of the parameters that have to be always keeping in mind is the solubility of the sample what is the solvent that is going to be used, what is the concentration to be used. If your solvent is uh, absorbing a lot of IR, use a deuterated uh, solvent. Also, you can change the path length of the liquid sample that is used. And at the same time, keep in mind that the, in the IR region, the optimal uh, absorbance is 0 0.7. And finally, we can use the auto sampler to reduce the drift in the baseline. There are several applications regarding the change in uh, thermal changes, and also the molecular con uh, conformation analysis it can be done use uh, BCD. So with this, I just want to close this webinar, inviting you again to the upcoming webinar next week. We are going to have uh, Dr. Leah Pandesia again with the circular dichroism uh, part two. Dr. Burgess is going to be talking about FDIR uh, theory and instrumentation. I'm going to be again coming back again talking about Raman microscopy and imaging. And then we are going to have Mr. Deathly talking about CS. FC uh, theory and applications. Please visit our website, look into the ebooks and tip and tricks uh, posters that we have. Uh, if you want them, we can send it to you. You can print them or we can send you a printed version. Uh, 
knowledge base, please visit our website to look into the different uh, papers or articles that have been published. And in ResearchGate, I just heard today from our marketing team that we have on ResearchGate, we have an ebook from CD that you can download there for the fundamental theory and application of circular dichroism spectroscopy. So with that, I would like to close and invite you again next week with the, I'm sorry, this is uh, circular dichroism part two is Dr. Leah Pandis. So with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Carlos. If anyone wants to submit questions now, you can do so. Uh, yes, I have a question. It says, it is possible to measure uh, the absolute confirmation of chiral ligand, ligand uh, cysteine on cadmium telluride nanoparticles. Yeah, it is possible. It depends. It, you're going to see a strong signal of the cysteine in the BCD. Uh, how long does a typical measurement uh, take? Uh, usually we can, what I do, I select, uh, I, and start increasing for 500 accumulation, 1000 accumulation, and it, it's going to take around uh, 20 minutes, but usually some samples can take uh, several thousand of cycles. So we can talk about 6,000 cycles. It could be between two to four hours. So there is another question, and Leah, please feel free to, to add, because uh, one of the questions is uh, talking about the, how long it takes to acquire BCD uh, measurement, and what about uh, to, uh, ECD or CD? Compare like how long it takes a BCD measurement to CD, and also, HPLC CD. I think that we have another specialist that is going to be talking about HPLC in the coming weeks. But I don't use a, I don't have experience with CD. But what I what I know is the signal is much more weaker than the CD, and actually it will take much more time. So I'll comment on that really quick. Um, sure. I can't speak on the HPLC, but in regards to um, ECD, what Carlos said, it, it depends on the sample, um, what the concentration is, how many uh, amino acids are in it, so how large your signal is. If your signal is rather weak, you might need more accumulations, as, which is why VCD takes so long. Um, but if you have a pretty good CD signal for ECD, it could take about a minute. Um, if you have a relatively weak signal, it could take potentially five minutes. It also depends on the wavelength range, too.
Uh, there is a Uh, there is a question of uh, can you talk about the input of the structural information of what format is required and how long does it take uh, to compute the calculated spectrum? So the software of JASCO, we can have inputs for third-party uh, software and the calculation of these uh, structures is going to depend on the molecule. Some molecules, if that they are small molecules, it, it can take a few minutes, but if the sample is if your molecule is a large uh, big molecule, it can take hours. And um, but that is going to depend also on the power of your computer. There's another question. So the greatest area, uh, yeah, the, the the greatest area for application for BCD, those that I have found is the pharmaceutical, uh, especially looking into research development of new uh, components that you are working on uh, simulation, and then you want to do a validation of what you are really um, developing in the lab is it, that is one of the greatest uh, applications for ma pharmaceutical and the other of course is the is related to any kind of uh, sample or or compound that is using the food uh, industry Uh, yeah, we have another question. Is we are not sure if BCD could provide valuable information on our sample. It is possible to get a sample run to test it out. Yes, uh, if you want to send samples to our lab, uh, you can contact us. Any of us, uh, you can contact me, and I will give you uh, all the instructions to send the sample to the lab. And usually what we do is run the samples and then have a conference call with a report when, where we explain what are the findings. Of course, the more information that you provide, it's easier for us to, to do the measurement. There is another question here, and I think, uh, Leah, I'm going to let you answer this one because you say, can you list down a few advantages and disadvantages of BCD instrument over the CDJ1000? Uh, I think if, I think that's yeah, very dependent on the application. Yeah. Um, because it, it's not necessarily one or the other, it's what region of the wavelength are you probing? Are you looking in the near infrared? Um, or are you looking in the UV or visible? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that's all the questions we had. If anyone else has another question, just send it forward. Um, otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Yep. Thanks, everyone, for your attention.